Fred Bowen writes sports fiction and kids <laughs> for kids eight years old and up and a weekly sports column in the Washington Post, which you are receiving right now. He is the author of 16 books and a picture book, a biography of the Red Sox legend, Ted Williams, titled No Easy Way. And I will forgive you since you're a Red Sox fan. Uh, <laughs> I have to admit, I am really excited to have out the opportunity to introduce Fred today. I am an avid sports fan. I've been playing sports since I was little and it's going all the way into my adulthood. Um, when I read Quarterback Season, even though it's for children, I found it very fascinating. Um, I saw his vision throughout the character. I felt Matt's expectations and I experienced this crazy ups and downs during the season like I was there. <clears throat> Besides it being an adorably cute story, I liked his way that he used the quotes at the end of each diary entry. It was brilliant and I can't wait to read his other books. Bowen is not your usual sports fiction writer. He usually, he always weaves a little real sports history into his fast moving plots and he includes a history chapter at the back. He likes showing kids the games they play are a part of a large, rich tradition. I wanted to share something with you that I found on his website. <clears throat> he wrote, I've been a big sports fan since I was a kid. My best childhood memories are from playing Little League in the park and basketball on the playground. I can still remember home runs, bad calls, and great comebacks from those games. My favorite reading back <clears throat> then was sports fiction and sports section in the newspaper. Many of today's kids are sports crazy as I was, and I am thinking about them as I write my books and my columns. I think that sums it up. Please join me in welcoming Fred Bowen to the Gators Book Book Festival. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Wow, I feel, I almost feel exhausted after watching the last guy. You know, I mean, he was so energetic, and I thought that when I, when I got up there, I thought, Oh, there's no way I can follow that guy. I mean, did you watch him? He was, oh, he had all sorts of props and stuff like that. So, but I'm going to be a little bit quieter. Uh, I have to be a little bit quieter. I must be older or something. <laughs> but that's right. My name's Fred Bowen, and I do a whole bunch of things. And in fact, when I go to schools and I talk, I sometimes tell kids, I say, I got six jobs. And they go, six jobs? And I'll say, wait a second. I had six jobs? That's unbelievable. And I'll say the first job I've had, first one I, I have, I've had it for over 30 years, I am a husband. And none of the kids understand that, but the teachers laugh. The teachers laugh all the time. They always say, ah, oh, yeah, right, okay. The other thing is, is that I'm a dad. I, uh, I got two kids, they're not even kids anymore. One's 28 years old, and when he was growing up, he wanted to be a baseball pitcher. Anybody play baseball here? All right, good, good. What are you, put your hand down? All right, terrific. Uh, and now he, uh, he coached or he played through high school and college, and now he's got a totally cool job. He is a baseball coach. He is the pitching coach for the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, who are playing their last game today. And they had a really tough season. It was his first season. And so I think he's a little happy that it's the last game. But it's a great game, or a, a great job for him. Second, uh, my daughter, uh, growing up, played field hockey. Anybody ever played field hockey here? Any of the moms? All right, great. You play everything, my goodness. Uh, and then she played softball. Anybody play softball? All right, terrific, terrific. And, uh, and the third job I have is I'm a coach. I have coached soccer, basketball, baseball, uh, softball, and have I forgotten anything else for years? In fact, I figured it out. I coached more than 30 teams, more than 30 teams. Now, of the kids, who plays sports here? Just about every kid plays sports. You know, I go to schools all the time, and I ask kids, I say, well, who plays sports here? Just about everybody plays sports these days, just about everybody. Uh, Oh, I don't even know. Turn it down. I will talk quieter. I'm getting a little depressed here. No, I'll talk slowly too. Should I? You ha already have a question. Wait a second. I'll I'll go. Uh, I'll try to be a little quieter, or hold it a little bit further away. How's that? Is that better? All right. 
usually it's guys your age who are saying, hey, turn it up. You know, I mean. <laughs> Third job or fourth job I had, I was a lawyer for more than 30 years, which brings up the questions from a lot of adults. Well, is it more fun to be a lawyer or a kid's author? And I can tell you, when uh, I go to schools, somebody always comes up to me and says, the kids are so excited that you're here. And I can tell you that after 30 years of being a lawyer, nobody ever said that to me. Nobody ever said, oh, wow, we're so excited that the lawyers are here. This is going to be, a, this is going to be great. Uh, fifth job. Is that right for the Kids Post? Who reads the Kids Post? All right, terrific. Yeah, a lot of adults read the Kids Post. Yeah, I've gotten uh, letters from uh, grandfathers, grandmothers, people who say, oh, hey, I, uh, I read the Kids Post. And the Kids Post had, the Washington Post had a great idea about 12 years ago, and they started to figure out that a lot of kids aren't reading this part of the newspaper, so they started a page just for kids. And you know what? They gave me the best job. They said, Fred, how would you like to write about sports every week for the Kids Post? And I thought, wow, that is a great job. So I write about all different kinds of sports. This one I wrote a couple of weeks ago. It was about uh, the Arlington Soccer League tried a week in which the parents couldn't cheer. Anybody play uh, soccer here? Do the parents make noise? Yeah, yeah. Well, for, for one week, they tried that the parents, all they could do was clap. And what they were trying to remind the parents, oh, yeah, or, yeah, do this. That uh, the silent wave. Or I went to Catholic schools, and the nuns used to teach us how to clap like this. But when you think of it, there are 500 kids in an auditorium. Do you really want them to all be clapping? No. But, and it's sort of the same way with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the parents at soccer games. But uh, other things I've written about, I just wrote that all the teams lately have been doing a great job in Washington. Uh, this past week, I forgot to bring it with me, I wrote about all the stupid things that athletes do. Like, Bri who's heard of Bryce Har Harper? All right, Bryce Harper's a wonderful baseball player, but he may not be the smartest guy in the world because what he did recently was he struck out, got so mad, he smashed his bat against the wall. Well, you know what he learned? The wall is really hard. And the bat smacked back and hit him in the eye. Hit him above the eye. He had 10 stitches above the eye. I will give him this. He went back out on the field bleeding. And then they started to notice. They said, gee, Bryce, you don't look so good. And so sometimes, you know, athletes, they do a lot of stuff that kids, you say, oh, you should work hard like an athlete. You should try hard like an athlete. You shouldn't give up. Don't do some things that athletes do, though. But what we're going to do a little bit today is, and uh, please, then we'll have uh, time for questions and stuff. We're going to talk about uh, uh, the books that I write. And I've written, as I said, I've written 16 books that combine sports fiction and sports history. Now, let's put the kids to work a little bit. Who can tell me what fiction is? either not real or it's make-believe or fantasy. Yeah, that's, boy, that's real good. <laughs> that's right. I make up all the stuff in the first part of the book. Uh, but I always put a chapter in the back, which is nonfiction. Who can tell me what nonfiction is? Something real. Yeah, there, it's, I love the history part of the book. I love writing about the history because... Lots of kids think, oh, hey, sports just, 
The whole world started when I was born, right? No, it didn't start that way at all. It didn't start that way. I'll talk about this book a little bit. It's called Playoff Dreams. And what it's about is about a kid who is the best player on a bad team. And I ask this lots of times I've, I, when I speak at schools. What kid here has ever been the best player on a bad team? Oh, yeah. There, I'll tell you, there is an epidemic in this country of kids who are stuck on bad teams. It's really, it's unbelievable. More than half of the kids are stuck on uh, bad teams. But what I do in that book, in the back, is I talk about the great players, baseball players, who played over a thousand or two thousand games and never made it into the playoffs. And does anybody know, we can ask the adults too, the guy who played the most games without ever going to the World Series or the playoffs? Anybody from Chicago here? Mr. Cub. Ernie Banks, exactly. He played 2,500, 28 games, and his team never made it to the playoffs. But Ernie Banks loved to play baseball, and so he had a saying. He'd say, it's a beautiful day for baseball. Let's play, too. And it was, he didn't, he thought it was great. It was, it's great to play baseball. Well, I'm a lucky person to be playing baseball. Another book. This one, who plays basketball? All right, a lot of hoop players, good. You play everything, don't you? <laughs> this one's called Off the Rim. And what it's about is about, or what I tell the kids about in, uh, is about the history of girls' basketball and how girls' basketball used to be very different from boys' basketball. And the book, or the story, is about a kid named Chris who really wants to be the star of the team. But he's not a very good shooter. So he goes to the best shooter in town, who happens to be a girl named Greta, and says, Greta, please teach me how to shoot. And he gets a little bit better. And then one day, he goes home to uh, Greta's house. And Greta says, well, you should talk to my mother. She was a big basketball star in high school. And so Chris asks her, he says, well, how many points a game did you score? And she says, I never scored. In fact, I never took a shot. Does anybody know the secret of the book? Anybody know the history of girls basketball? What do you think? Well, in the old days of girls basketball, what they used to do is half the players on the team, three of the uh, young women would just play defense, and three would just play offense. And so certain players, all they did, their only job was to play defense on one half of the court. And in fact, they played that game in Iowa and Oklahoma until about maybe 10 years ago. So in the book, Chris goes back to Greta's house the next day, knocks on the door, Greta says, oh, do you want a shooting lesson? And he says, no, I want your mother to teach me how to play defense. And lots of times in kids' sports, I coached, everybody walks onto the team and says, oh, I'm going to be a big star. Move over, Michael Jordan. I'm going to be the star of the team. But an awful lot of kids have to figure out, how am I going to help the team? And sometimes he helped the team by playing defense. Which actually brings up another uh, book I have, which is a basketball book called The Final Cut. And what it's, what it's about is about four friends who are trying out for a basketball team. And for the first time, they may not make the team. They may get cut from the team. And so I tell the kids about a very famous basketball player. The first time he tried out for his high school basketball team, didn't make it. Anybody know who that guy was? Michael Jordan, that's right. Who's heard of Michael Jordan? A lot of people have learned, heard of Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, the first time he tried out for his high school basketball team, he tried out for the varsity. And when it came time to split the team into the varsity, in the junior varsity, 
The coach said, Michael, you got to play with the junior varsity. You're not good enough to play for the varsity. And then about halfway through the year, they brought up three kids from the uh, junior varsity. And Michael f figured, oh, now they're going to bring me up. And he said, no, you're still not good enough for this varsity. And every time I tell that story, I think, wow, they must have had one heck of a varsity. Because they didn't need Michael Jordan. But then I start thinking, he's really not Michael Jordan yet. He's just a kid who likes to play basketball. Now, I also tell you in the back of that book about Bill Russell. Anybody heard of Bill Russell? Adults, too. Does anybody know how many NBA championships Michael Jordan won? He played 15 years. Very good. He won six NBA championships. Anybody know how many Bill Russell won? Add one more, 11. He won 11 championships. But when Bill Russell was 15 years old, he tried out for the junior varsity at his school because he knew he couldn't make the varsity. The coach had 16 kids try out. They had 15 uniforms to give out. And the coach didn't have the heart to look at one kid and say, hey, you can't make the team. So the coach went to his worst player, and his worst player was Bill Russell. And he said, Bill, you can stay on the team, but you have to share a uniform with another player. In other words, half the games, you're going to sit on the bench in your regular clothes in the other half of the games, you're going to sit on the bench in a uniform. In about five or six years, Bill Russell was the greatest basketball player on the planet. And you know what that tells everybody here? Things can change. Things can change. You may sit here and you may say, hey, Mr. Bowen, they dragged me here. I don't really like to read. You know what? You can say that. But you have to add one word. And you know what the word is? Now. I don't like to read now. Or you may say, oh, Mr. Bowen, I stink at soccer. Add one word. Now. I remember I used to coach basketball, and some kid would always say, oh, man, I'm not much of a shooter. And the parents would run up, and they'd say, oh, no, you're a great shooter. You're a great shooter. And, I, and the kid would say, well, why do I miss all the time? That doesn't seem like I'm a good shooter. He said, well... You could say, I'd say to the parents, I'd say, you know what? He could say he's a bad shooter, but he has to add that word, now. Because when Bill Russell was 15 years old, you know what he could say? I am a bad basketball player now. But if you work at things, you get better at them. Here's another one. Who likes football here? You like everything, I'll tell you. <laughs> This one's called Touchdown Trouble. And the history in this one is a football game that was played in 1940 between Cornell and Dartmouth. And you may say, well, gee, they're not very good at football. Cornell and Dartmouth, yeah, right. And uh, they, uh, but Cornell was the number one team in the country. They were undefeated. They had won the national championship the year before, and they were undefeated in 1940. And they were playing Dartmouth, and they, Dartmouth was uh, playing them tough, and they, Dartmouth was ahead, three to nothing. And Cornell got the ball with two minutes to go and started driving down the field. And who's watched football at the end of the game? You know what's happening. You got to put the ball down quick. You got to call the plays quick. They're moving down the field quick. They're, they're moving the chains quick. Everything's happening real fast. Cornell scored on the last play of the game. Well, when they looked, nope, they scored a touchdown on the last play of the game. When they looked at the film, when Cornell looked at the film, they saw that the referee had given them, by mistake, a fifth down. In other words, the referee had made a mistake and had given them an extra down, so 
They scored on a fifth down. The Cornell players took a vote and voted to give the game to Dartmouth. You know what? Don't be red. Right. <laughs> well, it's a famous game. It's the only time in the history of intercollegiate sports that a team has given a game back to the other team. By the way, the same thing happened 50 years later. Colorado was playing Missouri. Colorado was the number one team in the country. They scored on a fifth down. The coach from Colorado said, we're not taking a vote. We're keeping the game. So one of the reasons that I like to tell kids about uh, the history of the games is sometimes the history is when people were acting a lot better. You know, we get a lot of situations in which people will do almost anything to win. But the guys at Cornell, they felt like, hey, we're, no, we're going to, we're not going to, uh, uh, we're not going to, to win it that way. That's not winning it the right way. Another book. It's a book called Throwing Heat. And who's ever tried pitching here? Even the adults. Oh, man, pitching. <laughs> My son's the pitching coach. You need pitchers. You should always try pitching because after about high school, about half the players are pitchers. You might as well give it a try. Maybe you're a pitcher. But in this one, it's about a kid who throws the ball really hard. and then, But he's not that good. And his uh, sister's boyfriend comes along, and he's a pitching coach. And the kid just keeps throwing hard, but he's not doing very well. And the coach says, you know, you think that pitching's just throwing the ball hard, don't you? And he says, well, isn't it? I mean, it's, everybody talks about how fast somebody throws it. He says, the coach says, do you know the guy they think threw it the hardest? And the kid says, I don't know, you know, Roger Clemens, uh, Johnson, you know, some of the really great pitchers. He said, no, the guy they think threw the ball the hardest was actually a Baltimore guy, Steve Delkowski. They think he threw it about 105 miles an hour. And the guy, and the kid says, Steve Delkowski, I've never heard of him. He says, that's my point. He says, it's more than just throwing the ball hard. When you have a talent, you may be really good at something, some sport, if you don't work at it, you don't get better at it, it's just going to, it's not really going to happen for you. Actually, this was the, the book that uh, uh, was mentioned before I came up. This is uh, the latest one. It's called Quarterback Season. And what it's about is about a kid who is required to keep a journal in school. Have any of the kids ever been required to keep a journal in school? I have a few kids. Well, this kid is not real happy about it. This kid, Matt, he says, oh, man, I don't want to keep a journal. And so finally, his teacher says, well, what do you like to do? He says, well, I like football. I'm going to be the quarterback. And uh, so he, uh, he, starts to, he starts to keep the journal. And the history in it is actually about, oh, back in the 1960s, a guy who played for the Green Bay Packers kept a journal of his season. The book, it, they turned it into a book called Instant Replay, and that book was on the New York Times bestsellers list for 37 weeks. People have really been interested in sports for a long time in this country. And the last thing I'll talk about, and then I'll take questions, is a picture book. And sometimes the kids ask, did you do the pictures? No. Mr. Bowen does stick figures. And I don't think stick figures would make it for this book. This is actually a guy named uh, uh, Chuck Pyle, wonderful artist out in uh, California. And sometimes people say, well, did you meet the, the illustrator or the artist? No, never met him. I had a couple of emails with him. But what the book's about is about Ted Williams. And Ted Williams is the last guy to hit 400. And he was a terrific terrific baseball player. And like I say in the book, he was born 
very poor at a time when lots of people in America were poor, the 1920s, 1930s. But he was lucky in one way. He knew exactly what he wanted to be. And what he wanted to be was the greatest hitter of all time. He always said, I, I want to go down the street and have somebody point to me and say, that's Ted Williams, the greatest hitter who ever lived. And he was having a great year in 1941, and his batting average was over four, f 400 for most of the year. And then as the year went along, it started to drift down, drift down, until there were two games to go, and he had... Uh, his batting average was .39955, which you can round up to 400. And so even his manager, a guy named Joe Cronin, came up to him and said, Ted, why don't you sit the last two games and keep the 400 record? And uh, now... I once went to a school, and my wife is a uh, teacher there, and she said, we're doing biographies, Bo. Why don't you come in and talk about uh, this? And so when it came to the time for the choice, Peggy stopped and said, okay, kids, would you, if you had to make the decision, do you think Ted Williams should, as she said, keep the trophy, keep the record for 400 or do you think he should play? How many kids think he should keep the trophy? Oh, you guys read the book. It, it was funny. All the kids in her class, except for one, said, oh, keep the trophy. <laughs> they said, oh, no, no, don't risk it. Well, Ted Williams went to his manager and said, he said, if I'm not a 400 hitter the whole year, then I'm not a 400 hitter. So he played the last two games. He went six for eight, and that's why they named the tunnel in, uh, up in Boston after Ted Williams. He's a tremendous, tremendous player. But those are the books, and uh, I have a few more uh, minutes here. I'll certainly take questions. Want to uh, give any answers? Anybody who talk about, oh, I knew you would raise your hand. This, this is a young lady who likes to raise her hand. That's good. Go ahead. Oh, what's my favorite book? Of the ones that I've written? Okay. I get that question a lot from kids. They all, what's your favorite? Uh, and I, like I said, I've written 17 books, and actually another book is going to be coming out, which is going to be in the fall. That's a soccer book. Uh, but, you know, actually a very famous writer who wrote even more books than I have, I think it was John Updike, when they asked him what his favorite book was, had a great answer. He said, the next book. The next one is my favorite. Although one of the things I'm really proud of is that a lot of kids like different books. It's not like they all say, oh, yeah, this book is good, but the rest are kind of stinky. Forget it. <laughs> so the other question sometimes I get is, what kind of uh, books do I like to read? Uh, as an adult, I like to read histories. And I like to read about sports, write, like to read novels. All that kind of stuff. By the way, adults can ask questions, but I'm going to take kids first. Okay, go ahead. Oh, where do I get the facts for the books? Uh, you know, I'll tell you, it's kind of funny. When you write fiction and nonfiction, I kind of think that fiction is kind of easy because you can make it up. Nonfiction is really hard because you can't make it up. You have to do a lot of research. Um, for example, actually, in this book, my son, the baseball player and the baseball coach, was an intern at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. So there are real pictures in here, actual pictures of uh, Ted Williams. My son found the pictures. He did the research for that. Uh, I work with people uh, like at the National Baseball Hall of Fame. I uh, also do a lot of reading on uh, research uh, uh, for things. Also for the column. you got to... Uh, do a lot of research for the column. That's where the 30 years of being a lawyer comes in. You do a lot of research as a lawyer. Go ahead. Uh, lacrosse is one of my favorite books. Ah. Do you want to do a lacrosse book? Am I going to do a lacrosse book? How many kids want a lacrosse book? Raise your hand. 
You know, it's funny. Actually, about five, my answer to that used to be about five, six years ago, I was in Las Vegas speaking at a whole bunch of different schools. And uh, I asked the kids, who wants a lacrosse book? And some of the kids literally went, what's lacrosse? I don't think that would happen now. In other words, lacrosse is the fastest growing sport, I think, in America. Kids love it. One of the things that's kind of hard is I've never played it. And while I watch it uh, occasionally, I, uh, I, it might be a little hard for me to, to write about it. I haven't coached it. I haven't uh, uh, written about it. Or I haven't uh, played it. Sometimes kids will ask me, will you write a swimming book? Who wants a swimming book? Sw One of the things you learn when you write about sports is some sports are easier to write about than others. And I always say to the kids, I'll say, let's say in a swimming book, how would you describe it? Let's say the main character is a kid named Fred, although there are no Freds left. There are no, I go to schools and I'll say, is there a Fred here? No, nope, none. I think I'm the last one. But let's make the main character a kid named Fred, and he dives into the pool, and he brings his right hand over, and his left hand over, and his right hand over, and his left hand. It's really kind of, that's a tough sport to describe. And in fact, I sometimes tell people, even though the swimming in the Olympics is really exciting. I have to point out to the adults that there's usually a man in a bad sport coat walking the side of the pool kind of at this pace, making sure nobody fouls. They're actually swimming kind of slow. It's so hard, but it's so, I, I don't think I'm gonna write a swimming book because I don't like it, but you kids, if you like it, you write about it. You'd be much, much better at writing probably a lacrosse or a swimming book than I would. So any other questions? Oh, come on. <laughs> I knew you would. No, go ahead. Why was I inspired to write about sports? Well, you know what? I, I played sports as, as a kid. Now, how many, how many people, how many of the adults played sports growing up? How many of the women played sports growing up? Yeah. In about, uh, in June, it'll be the 40th anniversary of Title IX, which is supposed to give equal rights to women ab about playing sports. I hope to write a uh, column at that time, and one of the things I really would encourage all, particularly the young girls to do, talk to your moms, talk to your grandmothers about whether they played sports. Because lots of times, I remember I was walking the beach in my hometown, Marblehead, Massachusetts, and I ran into a woman who's my age. And uh, she said to me, she said, Fred, the biggest regret of my life is that I didn't play Little League Baseball. And I thought, that's right. When I was growing up, girls couldn't play a lot of sports. And and she looked at me and she said, we used to play with her, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the neighborhood and said, you know, Fred, said, I wouldn't have been the best player, but I wouldn't have been the worst. And, uh, you know, you tend to forget that, oh, yeah, that's right. For 50 years ago when I was growing up, oh, girls weren't allowed to do certain things. My daughter, the field hockey player, when she was growing up, First, she didn't like sports that much. She told me one time after a soccer season, she said, Daddy, I don't like games where you fight over the ball. And I thought, boy, that's just about every game. And then she used to play uh, defense on basketball, in basketball, and she'd knock the ball away. And I'd say, well, Carrie, why don't you go get the ball and score? And she says, Daddy, it's really her ball. And so, as you can tell, she wasn't real competitive when she was growing up. But then, it took a few years, what did she fall in love with? Field hockey, which is a fight over the ball with sticks. And she just loved it. But I'm telling you, if girls weren't encouraged to play, she wouldn't have played. She wouldn't have played. So I think one of the best things that certainly happened in my lifetime, oh man, Title IX, 
you know, how many of the girls here play sports? Just about all of them now. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. Uh, somebody else had a question? You have another question. What do you do with her? <laughs> Would you like to take over, by the way? There you go. Ask the question. What, like, um, what was the very first time you ever thought of being an author? Very first time I what? When did you ever think about being an author? Oh, first time being an author. Oh, my goodness. Well, the reason, one of the reasons that I wrote, I write kids sports books, when I was reading kids sports books to my, my son, I thought most of them were really stupid. You know, they were really dumb. I would be reading them and I'd think, oh, I could write a better sports book than this. And most of them just really didn't, uh, uh, I thought kids were really interested in sports and most of them were kind of silly, like the dog that played second base or, I think, you know, that's, that kind of stuff didn't, and there's so much that kids learn from sports, so I figured I could do this. And I had written movie reviews for newspapers. Who goes to the movies? I used to be paid to go to the movies. Is this a great country or what? <laughs> uh, it's getting to be about that time. It'll be one more question, then I got to go, and I'll be signing books over up front. Oh, up front. And we quite a few books. Okay, go ahead. What's my favorite sport? It's not swimming. <laughs> uh, to watch, it is baseball. To play. I am now at a point where the only thing I can play anymore is golf. And I can take you through my last round shot by shot if anybody wants me to do that. When I go home, I've actually, <laughs> I trained my kids very well. After I'd play golf, I'd walk through the door and I'd start to talk about it. My wife would say, Bo, you really should talk to somebody who cares about this. Uh, but my kids would always say, Dad, what was shot of the day? And you know, that's a very good way to look at things. Whenever you play a game or do anything, well, what was the best part? What was the best shot you had out of all those 110 shots? What was the, there's usually something uh, that's good about it. Okay, uh, thank you. First of all, thanks for coming out. It is one of the things, like I said, I was a lawyer for 30 years. One of the great things about writing kids' books is you get to deal with school teachers, um, reading specialists, librarians, bookstore owners, and book lovers like you. And I don't want to flatter you too much, but you're a lot nicer than the lawyers. All right.